coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Whenever trials hit us, and trials hit us, right? There is a, also a tendency for believers who also happen to be humans to want to get under condemnation because trouble has come upon us. Think about that. Whenever trouble comes, there's always that propensity, that tendency to want to get under condemnation. What did I do wrong? Not just me. It will. What did I do? If you struggle with your faith walk when fiery trials knock on your door, you need to know the truth so that you'll be able to answer the questions or some questions so you can silence the lying voice of condemnation. Welcome to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor A. Sadakri, coming to you from the World Harvest North Sanctuary located in North Georgia. We're so excited that you've joined us today because God has given us a new word. It's a prophetic message straight from the throne of God. It is entitled Freedom from Oppression. If you've been experiencing an, an escalation of pressure and concern and maybe even worry about what's going on in the world right now, this is a message from God for you. I want you to get out the Word of God. Go with me, and let's hear what the Spirit is saying to us about freedom from oppression. I've been sensing things in the atmosphere spiritually, and so I'm, I was seeking the Lord, and I kept getting a spirit of oppression. Anybody been feeling that spirit of oppression? Well, as I got to praying when we got back and seeking the Lord, the Lord started giving me revelation and prophetic insight into what's going on. When God gives me a prophetic message, it does not necessarily mean it's something to do with the future. It's about spiritual insight about what we're doing right now, what's going on in our lives. If we could, if God would just lift the veil and allow us to see things in the spirit, first of all, it would overwhelm us. Second of all, uh, we would know really what we're up against. And so uh, God has chosen to do it this way through the preaching of God's Word. And so if you have your Bibles, look there in John chapter 8, verse 30. I'm going to be speaking on freedom from oppression. I believe this is really going to touch some people's hearts and lives today. John eight thirty, As Jesus spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, If you abide, continue, dwell in my word, you are my disciples, truly. Uh, and you shall know the truth. When you continue in his word, you will come to know the truth, and the truth that you know shall make you free. They answered, the Jews who believed in Jesus answered him when he said this, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a what? A slave of sin. You're in bondage to sin when you commit sin. And so that's what he was telling them. You, if you have committed sin then you are a slave. You're a servant of that sin. Romans 6, Paul deals with that uh, in, in explicit detail, how that when we, are, we yield our members to sin, we become servants of sin or slaves to sin. And when we yield our members to righteousness, to do God's will, then we become slaves or servants of righteousness, right? Then he goes on in verse 35, A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, here comes that word again, you shall be free indeed. Now, not only if you follow in his steps and, and live according to his example that he has set for us as his disciples, not only will we be free in that regard or be disciples indeed or certain, uh, we're also made free indeed when we apply God's word to our life so that it makes us free. Now, 
one of the main purposes of Jesus coming to earth as our Redeemer was to set us free from all bondage. God does not want us in bondage to anything. He does not want us in bondage to sin, to fear, to Satan, or to death. None of these things. All the Old Testament believers lived their whole lives in bondage to fear of death. Hebrews tells us that, does it not? Now, you must believe as a Christian that Jesus wants you free. God wants us free, right? God desires us to be free for a reason. So that we can serve his purpose for our lives without fear. Many, of the, many times the, the main reason why more Christians don't do more for God or speak out for Christ's behalf here to the, in the world is because of fear. Fear of man. Fear of rejection. Fear of retribution. Fear of reprisal. Right? And so, so we, we back off and we're intimidated by people because of fear. And Jesus says, well, you're in bondage to fear whenever you can't serve me the way I would want you to serve me. So he came to set us free from the bondage of the spirit of fear. Now, when Jesus told them, now this is interesting. When Jesus told the Jews who believed on him in the story that they would be set free from being a slave to sin, they took issue with him and argued that they had never been in bondage to anyone. Now, this tells us that it is very possible for us to be in bondage as humans and not even realize it. Wow. What if we were in bondage to something or someone and we didn't even realize it? That's a sad state to be, isn't it? When Christ has died that we may have life and have it more abundantly and to live freely... And, and we don't even realize that, that we're, not, we're not in bondage. And so when, when we hear something about something that pertains to a bondage we have, we say, well, I've never been in bondage to anything. I don't know what you're talking about. So now you're not only in bondage, you're denying the truth. And only the truth can make you free from the bondages. If you ever experience the freedom of Christ, nothing else less will do. You will want freedom. There are people coming into this nation illegally and risking their own freedom, if you will, or maybe used to risk their own freedom, to come in here illegally because they want the freedom that we have. And we're in America, and we're taking it, uh, uh, we're esteeming very lightly our freedom and our liberties because when they are threatened, we're, we're not rising up to try to oppose those that are trying to control us and dominate us. Can I get a witness? Why is it that, we, that men and women died and they paid the, their life's blood to keep our freedom, to preserve our freedom, and first, back in our forefathers' day, they did it to establish our liberties and our rights and our freedom and to break away from the king, the old land, right? And, and so now we have all this freedom that Americans get to have, and it's like, oh, well. And if we're not careful, we can end up losing our freedom and our liberties. And we have done that, have we not? I mean, when the government can spy on us and, and know every detail of our life, they, they have exploited 9-11 to literally control every aspect of our lives, and we allowed it. And now all of that data is being collected, and they can use that against us. Satan does not want humans free. Now, when people, when we as humans don't realize that we're in bondage, then we need to hear what the truth says so that the truth that we know can make us free from that. This is why it is imperative as followers of Christ, we become students of God's Word that we might be made free through the Word that we know. That's why I'm very heavy into discipleship. I, I hardly ever preach an evangelistic message because God has called us to be adorners of the bride or to get her ready. We're to disciple the bride of Christ and get her ready for her bridegroom is coming and she needs to make herself ready. And the only way we can do that is through the Word of God. Apply that sword to the flesh of our life and circumcise our hearts so that we can become more Christ-like, right? This isn't in the message. This is free. 
Now, besides Jesus dying in our place so that we can live a life of freedom, the Lord also wants us to be made complete. Now, I'm going to introduce some things, and it's not deep. It just may be new to you. So I'm going to try to take it slowly so that you can grasp what I'm saying. Just don't tune me out. It's very uh, important that you hear what the Spirit has given me so that when you know the truth that I'm about to share with you, it will impact your life and set you free. Now, here's the thing. How many here has, in the last few weeks, seen all that's been going on in the world, all the threats that are going on uh, internationally, and, and it has caused you concern? Raise your hand. Now, it's one thing to be concerned. It's another thing to feel threatened. I can be concerned about something, but not feel threatened by it, and I'm all right. God wants us to be concerned about things, but he does not want us to be anxious over things. So whenever the enemy is roaring like a lion and we're seeing these billows roar and the winds are blowing and howling over the media and, and nations, leaders are rising up and threatening our nation, threatening our lives, threatening our freedom, it can cause us to become anxious. But we're not to become anxious, we're to trust God. Because God is our Heavenly Father, and it is His responsibility to take care of us, His children. He is the Good Shepherd. I lie, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Why? He is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort us, right? So, so we, we are to be concerned about things enough to go and pray about them, not worry about them, but we're not to allow that spirit of oppression to get on us because that's what the enemy is wanting to do through hostile situations, through storms that you have come up in your life. He is wanting to make you feel threatened so that he can oppress you. When the threat comes, the oppression is right there with it. Because if you do not answer the threat properly and correctly spiritually, then it opens up your heart to the spirit of oppression. Then the spirit of oppression will come on you and give you a spirit of heaviness and you'll be walking around stressed out instead of being in freedom and liberty. Jesus said these things must need to come. Matter of fact, Jesus says offenses will come. He was not moved by that. He says, but woe to the one who brings those offenses, who causes people to stumble, who causes people to sin, right? Now, so here he is uh, telling us that he came here to give us freedom. But there's also another uh, point to this message. He has come, now that we're saved, to, through his Holy Spirit and his word, to make us disciples so that we can become complete in Christ. Paul put it in Ephesians 4, to the fullness of the stature of Christ. I don't measure myself by someone else. I measure myself against God's word. God's word will tell me where I'm lacking. God's word will tell me where I am complete, right? G, uh, Paul writes in the, the epistles, he says, it is unwise for us to compare ourselves by ourselves. Now, so Jesus died so that we would have freedom. And he also, now that we are free in Christ, he wants to make us complete. These are two different things that I'm talking about, two different subjects. But whenever they're not distinguished, they can look as one. And this can cause problems. This will require us, because Christ wants us to be made complete in him, this will require, require, will require. <laughs> that we suffer for uh, Christ's sake and for the cause of Christ. Now, let's slow down. We're in it, the world, but we're not of it. In this world, we're going to have afflictions. Now, in Christ, Christ is going to use suffering through our faith to perfect us. Paul said in Philippians 2, that I may know him and share in the fellowship of his what? His sufferings, that I might experience his resurrection. And so the Bible in the New Testament is, is very explicit 
and talks in great detail about how, as Christians, we are called to suffer. Arm yourselves with the same mind, that the same mindset that Christ had. He suffered, and we too must also suffer, right? Now Christ has come to make us free, but he has also come to make us complete. Therefore, we're going to have to suffer. Now, who's going to be able to allow us to suffer? See, now, that's the distinguishing thing right there. Satan is not my father. I've been born again. I've been given a spirit of adoption whereby I cry, Abba, Father. God is my father. Satan is not my father. Satan does not have the right to correct me. Yes, hallelujah. Because if you'll read in Isaiah, it says, Isaiah 14, it says that Satan would have no, will have no mercy and has no mercy on his prisoners. Think about that. If you let yourself get in Satan's hands, you are in the hands of a master that will have zero mercy on you. And he will eat you alive and spit you out. And then he'll walk on you. Insult to injury. Now, we suffer because we live in an environment that is hostile toward God. And anyone who is associated or kin to him by the Spirit uh, and represents him, we are also going to be treat, uh, uh, treated with hostility. And we're seeing that, right? So we have concluded that the Lord desires that we be free and that we're also called to die to the flesh and live for Christ, that we may be complete in Christ. Now, as God's children... We must be able to distinguish between being free in Christ and being made complete through sufferings while in Christ. I'm going to bring it all together, but I've got to lay it down. If we don't view these two things separately, we can fall back into bondage to condemnation when trials come into our lives. Now we're going to get somewhere. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verse 1. I love this portion of Scripture because there's a lot of liberty in these verses that Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are where? In Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation in Christ. Matter of fact, Jesus came, and when he did, John 3.17 says that he did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might get saved, right? So if he did not condemn us while he was in the world and we were sinners, how much more now that we're in Christ is he going to stand up for us, right? Matter of fact, he showed me out of John 8, I've taught on the woman being caught in the act of adultery many times, but I have never caught this. Not only did Jesus not condemn the woman who was caught in the very act, brought out of the bedroom, where he, she was committing adultery, brought out in public in whatever attire she was in, and thrown down before Jesus and said, this woman was taken in the act of adultery. The Moses' law says such a woman shall be stoned, but what do you say? And this they said, testing him. And he did not address the woman's sin. What did he do? He said, he that is among you without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Not only did he not condemn her, he would not let others condemn her. Isn't that powerful? That tells me if God is for me, then who can be against me? If you start condemning me, then you're, you're standing in judgment of me and you're standing on the opposite side of Jesus because he is my corrector. He is my father. God is my father. He is the one who's going to... It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. I had rather fall into the hands of a man than the hands of a living God because God can destroy both the body body and the soul in hell the worst man can do is kill me right so if somebody wants to get sideways with you and start condemning you to hell you need to point out I wouldn't be so quick to do that brother sister because Jesus will stand up for you you remember when Stephen was being stoned, Jesus stood up. He said, they, they touch one of mine. <laughs> I can see that. Jesus standing up. He gets up. Mama gets up. You done crossed the line. 
you might as well say your last rites, have the priest come in, pray over you, pour holy water on you because it's over. Mama has stood up. Jesus had stood up. He was ready. But God's will had to be done. I love that. God does not give other people, judge not, lest you be judged with the same judgment. Isn't this powerful? See, this wasn't even the main point of the message, but it just, it just exploded. God's wanting you free from condemnation because other people want to judge you. Your, your relationship is with God. And he's got, he is your Holy Spirit. I'm not your Holy Spirit. That was such a revelation to me when I heard Joyce Meyer say that. You may not be where I'm at. I may not be where you're at, but you're not my Holy Spirit, and I'm not your Holy Spirit. We're all on the same path, but we're all at different places. Phew. Yes, amen. Where am I at? Verse 1. Have I even got through it? Oh, yeah, I haven't. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but he does not stop there. Who? Here's the condition. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, if you're born again and you walk according to the flesh, you're going to have some problems. Because you're going to first, you're going to walk under condemnation. Because only those who walk in the Spirit in Christ are not going to walk under condemnation. Those who walk in the flesh in Christ, they're going to walk under and live under that spirit of domination, that spirit of oppression, the spirit of condemnation, right? Now, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free. See, there's that word again, from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death condemned me to hell because I did not measure up. I could not keep all the laws. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Not sinners. He condemned sin. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here's how, here's how we keep the law. Not by keeping it, but by pleasing him. Many people focus on keeping the law. I've got to keep the Sabbath and, and remember to keep it holy. I've got to keep my dresses long and my hair short. Right? Come on. They're trying to keep the law. They're getting under condemnation. Whoever's under the law is under condemnation because nobody can keep the law. So what Jesus did, he, he came and fulfilled the law. And in him, I am fulfilling the law as long as I obey him and walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. If I'm walking in the Spirit, it does not matter if I make mistakes, if I, if I mess up. Because under, the, under grace, he covers me. Love covers a multitude of sin. But if I want to get out from Christ and start earning my own right, Righteousness through my own works. I am on my own and I am under condemnation. And the heaviness will wear me down. Have you seen people who are legalistic? It's like... And people who know and experience true grace. I'm not talking about greasy grace. Sloppy agape. I'm talking about true grace. They've got joy in their heart because they know they're in right fellowship with God. Somebody help me preach up in here. God wants us free. But Satan wants to put us in bondage. We've got to get past religion. It's not about earning. It's about resting. Have we got to verse 2 yet? The righteous, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk. Here it comes again. According to the flesh, according to our own dictates, our own traditions, our own beliefs, but according to the Spirit. Let the Spirit lead us, right? As many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For those who live according to the flesh, he's talking to Christians, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Oh, I got to do this and I got to do that. No time for God. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. Here's where we're going. For to be carnally minded as Christians, what? Death. But to be spiritually minded as Christians, what? Life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity. There it is. Hostile makes you an enemy of God. For it is not subject, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. You can't make yourself quit sinning. Now, let's break it down. Whenever trials hit us, and trials hit us, right? There is a, also a tendency for believers who also happen to be humans 
to want to get under condemnation because trouble has come upon us. Think about that. Whenever trouble comes, there's always that propensity, that tendency to want to get under condemnation. What did I do wrong? Not just me. It will. What did I do? If you struggle with your faith walk when fiery trials knock on your door, you need to know the truth so that you'll be able to answer the questions or some questions so you can silence the lying voice of condemnation. First of all, you've got to answer, are you born again in Christ Jesus? Secondly, are you living according to the carnal mind or according to the Spirit and walking in the Spirit by faith? If you answer yes to both of these questions, then you shouldn't get under condemnation when tr trouble comes into your world. Right? There is no condemnation. Well, I hate to end it there. There is so much. It's about to take off in the remainder part of this message in part two for next week. But today we're almost out of time, and I want to encourage you. Be sure and tune in this station, same time next week, for the conclusion of Freedom from Oppression. God has absolutely revealed some powerful truths about what's going on in the natural that we don't see with these eyes, but we know by the Spirit of God, and it's backed up by the Word of God. If you've been watching this ministry for any length of time, you know that I use the Word of God to back up everything that I teach because that's the only foundation we can stand on in troubling times. So be sure and tune in next week. If you cannot, you can go on our website and you can find it whenever it gets uploaded there and watch it in its entirety. Or if you would like to share this message through CD or DVD with one of your family members or friends, you can order it from the church office. The information will be at the bottom of the screen. As always, I want to give you an opportunity to send in your emails, your prayer requests uh, through uh, prayer at whcnorth.org and let us know how we can pray with you, stand in agreement, and see God move in your life. We have several of you that have contacted us recently about the, the things that you're going through, the grief and the sorrow that you have experienced in loss. And, and I want you to know that we're praying for you, we're standing with you, and we're, we're believing God to touch you, to heal you, and to restore you. That is our hope, that is our prayer, and that is our faith. And I'll, always I want to give you an opportunity to sow into this ministry. If we have sown into your life, as Paul teaches us in uh, Galatians 6, then we ask that you will sow back into this ministry so that we can continue doing what God has called us to do. We need partners. We need financial helpers to help us get this message out. Will you help hold us our arms up and let us do what God has done through your giving, through your support? We appreciate that. Always keep us in prayer because when you preach the truth, the enemy wants to resist that. But greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. So until this time next week, may God richly bless you and your family is my prayer. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512.